The air complement for defensive and offensive purposes was the Sea Harrier, which generally comprises about one third of the whole airborne strength and is able to operate from the helicopter carriers. The Sea Harrier force can shield the carriers and its escorts from air attack and also help take the air war to the enemy ship and land forces with a large assortment of guided and unguided weapons. The Sea Harrier's rotary wing counterpart is the Sea King, which, comprise, which comprises about two-thirds of the air complement. The most important Sea King, in numerical terms, is the Sea King HAS series in the anti-submarine and anti-ship roles. The Falklands campaign revealed the need for an airborne early warning system, and the Sea King AEW version was quickly created. It features a radar antenna in an inflatable ray dome attached to the starboard side of its fuselage. The ray dome mounting swivels to drop it below the line of the fuselage to permit hemispherical coverage with the helicopter. Data from the Sea King AEW was then used to control the air battle around the carrier. It's worth noting that rather than a purely vertical takeoff, the Harrier takes a small run using a ski jump in front of the flight deck to provide some upward momentum. This allows the carriage of more fuel or more weapons, obvious advantages to range and combat capability. Another model that resulted from a lucky accident was the original Harrier. This aircraft had been designed as the P-1127 demonstrator with the VTAL, or vertical takeoff and landing. Its capability was provided by the forward thrust vectoring nozzles of the Pegasus engine. A planned supersonic development for the operational role was cancelled and the P-1127 was developed via the Kestrel pre-production type as a production model, close support tactical reconnaissance roles. The great advantage offered to the Harrier by its power plant was that it no longer required a proper airfield. This eliminated the vulnerable airfields as targets for preemptive attacks. The Harrier GR Mark I entered service in 1969 as a very simple aircraft offering limited capability, but was soon improved with the Harrier GR Mark III with a more powerful engine and more advanced avionics. These included a laser rangefinder and a marked target seeker. These changes meant better all-round field performance with a heavier payload and an improved ability to find and destroy targets with laser-guided bombs. Improved Harrier II was later developed by the American firm McDonnell Douglas in collaboration with British Aerospace. Features included a more powerful engine, a larger and more advanced designed wing, a modernized cockpit, upgraded avionics, and the ability to lift a substantially larger load of more diverse weapon types. The RAF 
have acquired this more effective tactical warplane as the Harrier GR Mark V. It entered full service in 1989. Another version is the Harrier GR Mark VII, which features a night attack capability through the addition of an imaging infrared sensor in the nose. Harrier GR Mark V and Harrier GR Mark VII signaled the current high point in the British tactic of attacking battlefield targets by day or night. Moreover, with steadily improving levels of offensive and defensive electronics, the later versions of the Harrier are also well able to handle themselves among sophisticated air and ground defenses. The geographical extent of the UK's military interests has expanded since the end of the Cold War to include regions in the Persian Gulf and the Balkans. This, combined with the fluid nature of modern operations in political and military dealings, has placed an ever-growing emphasis on tactical airlift operations to deliver, reinforce, supply, and if necessary, evacuate military forces. Yet at the same time, the United Kingdom's tactical airlift capability must still be available to undertake humanitarian efforts in any part of the world at a moment's notice. The RAF standard tactical transport is the classic C-130 Hercules. This aircraft set the pattern for aircraft of its type and it was unveiled in the United States during the early 1950s. It is an eloquent testimony to the superb nature of the Hercules that its replacement is the modernized Hercules II including an updated power plant and a host of improved electronic features. The Hercules can operate from short, rough airstrips in close proximity to the front line. It can perform the whole spectrum of tactical airlift roles involving personnel and equipment. It can also operate in the airborne forces role. The ability to drop parachutes at low to medium altitudes and to deliver heavy loads right at ground level with the LAPES, or Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System. When Iraqi army formations acting under Saddam Hussein invaded and occupied Kuwait in 1990, the United Nations entrusted the task of liberating Kuwait to a coalition of countries led by the United States. The British provided the next largest armed forces personnel committed to this effort. 
They used a combination of sea and air lifts to deliver and maintain air and ground forces in the region. The Royal Navy contributed its own unique capabilities in the waters of the Persian Gulf. They included armored and mechanized units complete with organic artillery for the Allied land effort and a number of fixed and rotary winged aircraft in the coalition's huge air armada. The active element, constituted by the warplanes, was backed by a major airlift and in-flight refueling capabilities to ensure and then maintain a high level of operational readiness and sustained operational capability. A major element in the air effort to keep army units well supplied and as mobile as possible was the Chinook helicopter. Although based on an elderly twin rotor design, it's been constantly updated in its power plant and electronics to keep it in the forefront of medium lift helicopters for tactical purposes. The operations to liberate Kuwait began with a major air campaign with cruise missiles and manned aircraft. First, to destroy Iraq's command, communications and air defense capabilities, and then to isolate the Iraqi ground forces in the south of the country and in Kuwait. The most important British contribution to this stage of the offensive was provided by the tornado which was able to penetrate deep into Iraq at high speed and low altitude with a considerable payload delivered with extreme accuracy. The primary weapon at this stage of the offensive was the JP-233 sub-munitions dispenser. This weapon remains with the aircraft, but releases a cargo of sub-munitions over the target. The JP-233 dispenses a larger runway cratering sub-munition and more numerous but smaller area denial anti-personnel minelets in order to prevent the enemy from moving in rapidly to repair the damage. The aircraft were also fitted with a laser ranger and a marked target seeker under the nose. Initially, the tornado was unable to deliver laser-guided bombs because they lacked the ability to mark the target with laser radiation onto whose reflection the bombs home. But such capability was soon provided, and the efficiency of the tornado forces was increased dramatically. While the tornado concentrated on the longer range interdiction role, the short range attack task was the responsibility of the Jaguar. It played a major role in the land campaign of Operation Desert Storm, which began on the 24th of February 1991 and lasted for 100 hours. Although it was a somewhat outdated aircraft, its basic airframe and power plant possessed only moderately advanced electronics, the Jaguar proved itself an admirably reliable and effective warplane. It could reach its target at high speed and at low level while carrying a substantial payload. It could then attack with extreme accuracy. In terms of cost effectiveness, the Jaguar proved itself to be more than qualified. Another success for the Allied forces in the land battle was the MLRS, or Multiple Launch Rocket System, which fired large numbers of accurate rockets, a considerable range. Much targeting data for the MLRS was provided by the Midge Reconnaissance Drone, which could cruise to a considerable range and photograph a target area before returning for a parachute landing. The exposed film was then rapidly processed and assessed for tactically useful information. 
the Lynx battlefield helicopter also proved useful in combat. Its high speed and relatively small size allowed it to operate over the front line for the gathering of optical reconnaissance. Information was radioed to relevant headquarters so that action could be undertaken quickly. The Lynx's primary armament of tow heavyweight missiles was also a considerable threat to the Iraqi armored force. The Iraqis used Soviet tanks that the tow system had been specifically designed and upgraded to defeat. Flying in the very twilight of its long career, the Victor was the primary British contribution to the Allied nation's vital in-flight refueling capability. The Victor had been developed as the British trio of so-called V-bombers with the nuclear bomber role. When this role was made obsolete, the Victor was converted to fit the tanker role. The availability of the Victor tanker allowed aircraft to roam further from their bases than would otherwise have been possible with internal tanks and external drop tanks. The in-flight refueling capability also allowed aircraft with punctured fuel tanks to take on enough fuel to reach safety. With three hose and drum units, one in the lower fuselage and one in the wing, it was able to refuel three tactical aircraft simultaneously.